So I want to take a little question. Henry VII was able to successfully restore law and order. How far do you agree? Now, Henry VII is very keen to be able to restore law and order, but ultimately he's got a kind of lack of experience. He's been in exile in Brittany for 14 years prior to becoming the King of England. So he needs to ensure that he has kind of got this good government, which he wants to be able to ensure can continue to support him. Now, most historians do agree that Henry was able to overcome the difficulties he would face and he restored his government at national, regional and local levels. So we'll take these as our different factors. factors. So one way in which he's able to restore his law and order is through his national or through his central government. Now, it's key to remember that the king is at the centre of the government. However, he can't rule on his own and he needs the advice of other people and he needs a, a, a solid set of advisors to be able to support him. The most important element in providing this was the King's Council. Now the King's Council is chosen by the King and although there are over 200 councillors during his reign, meetings end up being attended by a much smaller group of people. So on most occasions he relies on an inner group so that the efficiency of the central, central government can be improved. Now, this inner group is made up of Lord Chancellor Morton, who is responsible for Morton's Fork, Lord Privy Seal Fox, Lord Treasurer Dynam, and five other people. Now, Henry also uses smaller committees within his council, a little bit like what Richard III had done. But the difference is he uses that practice more frequently and he establishes other courts, such as the Court of Requests, the Court of General Surveyors and the Court uh, sorry, the Council Learned in Law. Now, the Court of Requests is part of the Royal Council and it deals with individual requests from ordinary people. So it gains the nickname Court of Poor Man's Causes. The Court of General Surveyors checks the revenue coming in from Crown lands and lands which the King was feudal overlord of. And your Council Learned in Law is designed to be able to manage that revenue. Its task is initially to be able to deal with problems concerning royal lands and royal rights. So it ultimately ends up replacing a lot of the role that the Parliament would have normally had. The Council learned in law wanted to be able to exploit the King's riches and they don't use Parliament to be able to do that. Instead, they're the ones that deal with the bonds and recognizances. However, the Council learned in law isn't an official law court which therefore means that anybody who is accused of or anybody who wants to contest the bond that's been placed upon them therefore can't actually challenge it themselves. Now there's been some debate about how the council has been composed but it's actually quite it's actually very little different not very different at all from the Yorkists as most of the members of the nobility most of the members of the council and the nobility or the members of the church However, Henry does appoint people who are skilled at their jobs to be able to support them. He doesn't automatically appoint people just based upon their title. So, for example, Reginald Bray and Edmund Dudley rise from power as lesser landowners, but because they're particularly skilled, and they're particularly skilled lawyers in that case. So to be able to exploit his finances, the king needed experts around him in property law, administration, to help him get the most from that national or central government. The other main part of his government is his parliament. Now the parliament, he limits the amount of times in which they meet. So parliament only actually meets seven times throughout Henry's reign. Parliament wasn't a permanent figure. The king has got the power to be able to summon them, dissolve them as he wishes. It's only called when he needed to be able to access money or to be able to pass laws. It is, like today, composed of two houses, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The House of Lords, however, is seen as the more important house. And um, the House of Commons, people who were put in the House of Commons, is only elected by a very small and wealthy electorate who choose them to get there. So Parliament only meets seven times out his reign. Four of them are in the very first decade of his reign. So that's a pretty clear indication of the limited role that they had. Henry does use it to be able to uphold law and order, and he uses it in particular to be able to pass acts of attainder. 
So one great example of when they meet is 1487, the Parliament meet for a month to be able to raise finances to deal with the Battle of Stoke against Lambert Simnel. Now, Parliament also grant him taxes. So, for example, in 1485, when Henry first gets into power, he is granted tonnage and poundage for life. Now, tonnage is on his exports, so tax he can claim on his exports, and poundage is on tax, which he can claim from his imports. Now, your next factor is going to be your regional government. So, the first regional government is the Council of the North. Henry is fully aware that the authority of the central government doesn't stretch as far as the North, Wales and Ireland. Central government is very easy to be able to control around London, for example, but any further than that, and Henry risks running out of that control and losing his strength. So Henry does develop that Yorkist use of his regional councils. So with the North, at first, Henry had used the Earl of Northumberland to be able to act as his deputy in the North. But the Earl of Northumberland is murdered during the Yorkshire Tax Rebellion. So instead, Henry appoints the Earl of Surrey. He appoints the Earl of Surrey because the Earl therefore then has to listen to what Henry's saying. He has to follow legislation because if he doesn't, he therefore then risks losing his land in the South as well. So the Earl of Surrey has no particular loyalty to the North, but he does have loyalty and the keenness to keep his land in the South. He has to do a good job in the North to keep them in the South. Now, the Council of the North not only had the responsibility to defend the northern border, but it also had its own administ administrative power so that it can enforce law and order really quickly. The major change, however, is that the Council of London will watch the Council of the North activities. This ensures that people are only appointed to the Council of the North who are chosen by Henry and the Council of London himself to stop them becoming more powerful. Your next one is Wales. Now, Wales had been a really unruly area during the War of the Roses. Um, there wasn't a continuous effective rule from London, and it's also there's Welsh marchlands. There had not been a single system of counties, a single system of lordship, so therefore it's open to different marcher lands who are able to extract their own privileges from their control. Henry therefore brings in and revives the Yorkist system of the Council of Wales in 1493. This time it's controlled by his son Arthur. And when many of the Welsh marcher lords die, Arthur is then able to take more control over Wales and the marcher areas, it la the marcher lands itself. Ireland also is a bit of a problem for Henry. However, he's maybe not as successful in Ireland as he is in other areas. Ireland is a Yorkish stronghold, which have been a particular problem for Henry. They support, for example, Lambert Simnel, and they support Perkin Warbeck as well. Direct English control is limited to an area around Dublin known as the Pale. Now, this isn't an area which any Irish families who are loyal to Henry have a huge amount of control over. Now, in 1494, they introduced something called Poynings Law. And this says that the Irish Parliament can only be called to pass um, laws with the prior approval of the king. Henry used Poynings Law to be able to attempt to limit his, oh, sorry, increase his authority over Ireland. But there is limited success in this. It's named after Henry's deputy in Ireland called Sir Edward Poynings. However, he fails to actually increase his control. The only area which Henry is able to therefore bring under his control is the Pale. But he has to be able to rely upon traditional families, such as the Earl of Kildare and the Kildare family, to be able to control that land for him. Now, local government. During the War of the Roses, there had been a breakdown of local government. That law and order in the localities had been hard for Henry to be able to address to begin with. So they had to rely upon a number of powerful families. So, for example, they do have to rely upon the Earl of Shrewsbury in West Midlands and they have to rely on Lord Hastings in the North Midlands to be able to control that area for them. Now, Henry then begins to develop his system of the justice and the peace. This is not a new position, 
but in the past, these unpaid officials had either been under the influence of larger um, and more important members of the gentry, or they'd use the system to further their own interests. Now, Henry doesn't want this to continue. So Henry instead changes it so that the justice of the peace are appointed annually. And Henry himself, like Edward IV had done, Henry himself con continued to choose men from the second rank of landowners, meaning that their loyalty is assured because they don't want to lose their land. The role of JPs is also widened. So, for example, they will implement social and economic statutes. statutes. They will dispense justice, try and criminal offences. They uphold public law and order. Um, and they also help to be able to reform, reward informers. Now, JPs are almost like the workhorses of administration. There are between 30 to 60 local landowners who are appointed for each county. The role was coveted as it gave recognition of your status and it was a bit of an honour to be able to be made a JP. However, it is a really hated role. Although their power is greatly expanded, JPs do rely on other people bringing offenders to them to inform them of what's been going on. And they're also pretty reluctant to actually act in some cases because they are unpaid. And also it shows that Henry is just acting upon goodwill to be able to restore his law and order in England.